Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. Even if short-lived, market vol episodes as protracted as that of Monday, August 5th demand our attention. In seeking some understanding of the why of successive 10% Nikkei moves and a 65 pre-open handle on the VIX, it was a pleasure to welcome Oliver Brennan to the Alpha Exchange. An FX vol strategist at BNP, Oliver brings theoretical training in physics to the related but also very different world of option pricing. In setting up the discussion, we first explore a series of past FX vol episodes including the Euro-Swiss break and CNH repeg in 2015 and Brexit from the following year. At the heart of these events lie economic imbalances and central banks that get tested by the markets to hold the line. We shift to a discussion of the setup going into early August in the Japanese yen. Always an investment currency because of its balance of payments profile, Oliver argues that carry trades had gotten especially extended as dollar-yen trended so consistently higher. Market participants were long calls and long carry, and the dealing community was especially exposed to an increase in both realized and implied vol. He notes as well the absence of corporate supply of yen vol in this recent event, something that exacerbated the repricing. With the tails especially underowned, the more than 6% sell off in dollar yen over the course of a week caught the market well off sides. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Alpha Exchange, my conversation with Oliver Brennan. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Oliver Brennan. He is an FX vol strategist in the Markets 360 research team at BNP. Oliver, it's great to have you as a guest on the podcast today. Hello, Dean. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Excellent timing for our conversation. We've just experienced a pretty seismic, if short-lived, risk episode that really flared up around the world, probably started in Japan, but absolutely made its way into important risk metrics like the VIX and S&P option pricing. So whenever something like this happens, it really demands attention and explanation. So that'll be a big part of our conversation. Let's get underway. Let's learn a little bit more about you and your career history. Tell us how you wound up at BNP. Take us back to the beginning of your career. Well, the beginning of my career is very unusual beginning, actually. I started as a physics teacher at the very beginning of my career. And then after taking some time out and seeing the world, my first job in finance was actually on the buy side, quite an unusual step into finance compared to where typically people start now. Within the buy side, actually my first day on the FX trading desk, well, it was the 15th of September 2008, which I'm sure rings a bell. So my time in FX was born out of Lehman's ashes. And really as a fresh-faced junior at that time, there was little I could initially contribute to on a day-to-day basis in the heat of that financial crisis. But look, it was a great seat to be in at the time and instilled right at the very beginning the importance of hard work and especially something which has supported me throughout the career, the importance of evidence-based research rather than listening to and believing in all the hearsay that can float around in times of crisis. You've got to do the work yourself. You've got to figure it out and you've got to understand what's driving the market and why the market's being driven that way and what that means in the future. Yeah, it's an interesting set of comments just around how we think about markets. And I think we're all learning from each other, but boy, there is an inundation of commentary and charts and dare I say clickbait out there. So sometimes you have to really filter through the noise. It's really interesting to hear about your start date. And I've had many guests at this point on this podcast are quite a bit older than you and even older than me. And sometimes I'll hear that a guest's first day was October 16th, 1987, days before the stock market crash of 87. Boy, that is quite a start date. I'd love to learn a little bit more about your training in physics. And of course, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the modeling of financial assets and borrowing from certain equations in physics. And so there's a beautiful connection there. But of course, what do we learn time and time again? And September 15th of 2008 is certainly one of those experiences where 
markets can just do things that the models just can't predict. And I think that's going to be a theme for us throughout this conversation, just given what's happened in the Nikkei and so forth last week. But just tell us about the degree to which you can utilize your academic training in in physics, and then where you have to recognize that markets are markets and they're just not governed to any degree like the physical sciences are. I mean, in principle, there's lots of similarities, large, complex systems, large-scale approximations, using equations to understand dynamics, the laws of motion and thermodynamics and entropy and so on. But in practice, the differences are far greater. The first difference really is science is collaborative. Scientists' entire aim is to help each other understand and to gain a greater understanding. And finance is very, very far from being collaborative. It's fact, it's, if anything, it's anti-collaborative. It's all about gaining an advantage over the next person to try to eke out the possibility of profit. So the most important lessons that I take from my background is not necessarily one equation or another. It's in the process and it's in the method. And it's in using the scientific method to continually attempt to understand what's happening. And then going through the theory, hypothesis, test theory process over and over again to reach some level at which there's a consistent framework and a coherent understanding of how markets may be behaving. And of course, every year or even less, that understanding is challenged and you have to introduce new variables and new understandings to it. But it's the process which has really stood me well throughout my career. Well, I haven't heard it framed that way with regard to this idea that there's wholesale collaboration in disciplines like physics and other sciences. And you are correct. Even as the collective work in markets across the buy side and the sell side and so forth is in trying to find, say, truth in some sense or trying to understand things, there obviously is a very competitive aspect to it. Well, let's just do a little bit of review. You mentioned your first day in markets as during the unfolding of the Lehman crisis. And of course, that was a mortgage mispricing crisis. It was a leverage crisis. But anything that's that large is going to propagate itself out. And so no asset class is going to be unscathed. And there were some just gigantic moves in FX during that period. And then when we talked before this call, I rattled off a number of other just FX vol events that, at least for me, more of an equity derivatives person certainly paid a lot of attention to. We had the euro crisis that ran for years, maybe Draghi put his foot down in 2012, but that brought a lot of uncertainty. China's episode in 2015, of course, the unwind of the Euro Swiss peg in 2015, Brexit brought about a lot of volatility. And so there's been a lot of these episodes, even in developed markets, I would say. And so I was just hoping you could reflect a little bit on the learning experiences. I know a lot of these are idiosyncratic. There's policies and economics, and even personalities that are at the center of them. But I was wondering if there were any commonalities that as you step back and you think through your time in evaluating these periods, are there any commonalities that stitch these events together, whether it's central banks, markets? What do we learn from these events of frequency that are greater than the models would suggest they should happen? Of course, as a UK resident, I've been privileged enough to experience some kind of political event roughly once every 18 months for the last 10 years. So (laughs) we're well versed in UK politics and political risk for the sterling at least. Yeah, there's the one commonality through all of these events you describe is imbalances. And it may be facetious for me to just sit here and say, oh, there was an imbalance. Of course, there would have been some kind of unwind and some kind of consequence. The trick or the key really is to figure out where the imbalance is and how it has developed and therefore how it may unwind. As you said, in the Lehman crisis and the GFC, there was an imbalance domestically in the US, but there was also the much broader imbalance of Europe and Asia's large surpluses, which meant that there was this blowback to the rest of the world and credit tightening globally. So then if we think about these FX events in particular, so the Euro-Swiss exchange rate and the dollar-China revaluation, In both cases, there was either a market expectation that the central bank would continue to do what it does, 
or the market expectation that central bank wouldn't do something. There was this expectation of a continued stance of central bank policy. But FX is probably more well governed by random walks than by autocorrelation when it comes to this. And in each case, the central banks found their positions increasingly untenable because of economic imbalances. So the minimum exchange rate in Euro-Swiss became economically unviable. Or the level of dollar CNH in 2015 was artificially held low and there was increasing outflow pressure, which in part was driven by, for example, large domestic borrowing from foreign lenders. So there was an underlying imbalance in both of these cases, which created both the initial need for the central banks to act more forcefully, but then created the conditions for the imbalance in the currency. So then in Euro-Swiss, for example, if one market participant is buying as much Euro-Swiss as being sold at any given price, then it's market tendency to test quite how strong that commitment is. And with fairness, the minimum exchange rate lasted for a long time until it hit a pressure point. And then in dollar China, the, the similar dynamic was in place where the spread between the fixing and the tradable spot rate kept on widening, reflecting demand for dollars from dollar China investors until eventually the central bank couldn't pursue that policy anymore. So these two imbalances then led to a significant revaluation, extremely significant in US Swiss. But I think it's important, and we'll probably come to this later as well, it's not necessarily that the imbalance created the crisis or the vol event, is that the imbalance contributed to the magnitude of the response. So there can be these kind of events everywhere all the time, but these events only become important when there's this initial setup, this ex-ante positioning setup, or an incredible or uncredible central bank position, which is going to be tested by the economic backdrop. So that brings you to Brexit, really, where there was not necessarily an imbalance in positioning, but an imbalance in the outcomes, where there was either a large shock to the domestic economy or no shock to the domestic economy. And for the few months, six months or so before the vote happened, actually, the market was reasonably well pricing the risk. It was pricing an outcome in which sterling either fell by 10% or rose by 10% if it was a 50% chance of either outcome. The problem really was as the vote approached and the only information that investors had about the outcome was opinion polls, which by their nature are reasonably uncertain, that led to an imbalance in positioning as the date approached, which then unwound very quickly overnight and had knock-on effects as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. Brexit for me was an experience you can learn a lot from. And I think watching it from the US and from, a, again, an equity landscape, an equity derivatives landscape, and looking at the behavior of British pound vol going into it, I think you'll learn a lot. To me, a main takeaway there is when you have these date certain events on the calendar, referendums, elections, November 5th of this year as an example, and the market sees that event coming and it can price derivatives with very, very different levels, whether the option expires before or after the event. And then again, seeing the behavior of British pound vol just rise so dramatically, we're talking into the mid thirties, uh, very, very short dated options. To me, the statement there is the market's ability to bear risk through the event is wholesale compromised. You've really, really got to coax someone <laughs> into selling you the vol. And they're basically saying, look, here's the price I think I can't lose money on. It's going to be in the thirties. So there's this erosion of the capital base that typically is able to sell convexity. And you're seeing a similar sort of thing in the VIX curve in and around the US election. I think some very interesting takeaway there. The other thing I just want to go back to, and maybe we can just riff on things like Euro Swiss, or maybe it's the sort of repeg in August of 2015 on dollar CNH. You get these trades that are built around the expectation that the central bank will keep its promise. And in Euro Swiss, at least, there was a lot of folks hanging around that peg, eking out a very marginal amount of carry 
just with the idea that they felt like they'd shaken hands with, I think it was Thomas Jordan, I can't remember, who was the head of the S&B, but they felt like, okay, there's not a lot of carry here, but it's kind of guaranteed. And so there were these variant swaps and other like instruments of extreme convexity that you could buy for a song. that basically pegged currency type variant swaps that just absolutely exploded. And so that just gets me back to your comment that it's the interaction between what the central banks are doing, the policy, and maybe the economic unsustainability, but also the trades that get built around them. So it's a complex system that's interacting. I'd love for you to reflect on that a little bit. I think just to go back as well on my history, the vast majority of my career has been on the buy side. And so some of the ways I think about these events is probably slightly different from a lot of people. I don't have that experience of being in a trader's desk on the sell side. I don't have that experience of risk tapping me on the shoulder saying that you may or may not run this risk. And so when I'm thinking about Euro-Swiss, for example, well, from an expected outcome perspective, like you say, you would probably make a bit, but you might lose a lot. But what's the market pricing in terms of the make a bit versus lose a lot distribution. And we'll come to this again later, but I think that's where FX options distributions can be really useful. There's a huge amount of information there. But what we try to do here at BNP Paribas is, is figure out exactly this. What is the market giving you? What is the potential distribution of returns that you're buying into if you, for example, buy a variant swap or sell a vol swap or do a range trade? Compared to what do we think is the potential outcome. And that speaks to the central bank. Do we think the central bank will keep its promise? Do we think the market thinks the central bank will keep its promise? And not always, and in not all currencies, but there's often somewhere where there's a mispricing, where there's this imbalance, where there's the opportunity to take a positive expected value trade, even if it might look unlikely on the face of it. And these examples were great ones, and they had very large spot-driven outcomes. But there's always these positive expected value trades which are available, which may not make the headlines. They may not be the biggest spot moves in in one day, or they may not be the biggest vote winners or vote losers at the time. And they're the kind of opportunities which look most interesting when it comes to using vols. Well, you're an expert in trade construction and understanding how these complex products work in mapping the various Greek profiles across time and spot space for various currency pairs through derivatives and mapping the vol surface. Talk to us a little bit about the way in which you interact with teammates from the economic side at BNP, the folks that are covering very, very directly the central banks. What's that information exchange and interaction look like? Sure. As you may know with your background, Options and derivatives can be quite esoteric, especially when you talk to the man in the street. They don't actually care what Vega is, let alone Vano or Volga or any of the other higher order Greeks. So this is where part of my previous experience comes in as well. It's actually been really useful having been a teacher. One of the key jobs in my role is not only to figure out some interesting dynamics in the market, but it's to be able to talk about them and to be able to engage and Talk about them in a way that the vast majority of market participants can engage with rather than being extremely niche and extremely esoteric. And that example there, well, if we're talking to economists on the team, it's extremely valuable to talk about expected distributions, what the market pricing is, where the market distribution may differ from ours. It's extremely invaluable to talk about third and fourth order Greeks in terms of an options position. My job when it comes to interacting with the rest of the team is to think about where the market pressure points may be, particularly if we think a market forecast or an eco forecast may be significantly different from where the market is pricing. Well, let's focus on dollar yen, because obviously that's a huge part of the pretty seismic, if short-lived, risk episode that began a week ago and feels like it's settling down. I was just looking at the VIX. It took the VIX fully two days to double. It went from something like 18 to 38. And as of 
the time I'm saying these words, it's basically gone in half. It's now back down to 19. That's got to be one of the shortest round trips of a doubling and then a halving that we've ever seen. I'm trying to think back. There might be a couple that compete with it, but boy, that came and went pretty quickly. The yen is a fascinating currency. It's got these really interesting risk properties associated with it. For the longest time, if you map the correlation between the yen and the VIX, it would be at least dollar yen versus the VIX, it would be negative. So VIX up, stronger yen. So it was this haven currency for the longest period of time. You had episodes like the nuclear reactor meltdown. I want to say that was 2011, which brought a giant move in the VIX and an incredible rally in the yen. So you had these periods, but those correlations can come and go over time. Share some of your thoughts on just the risk characteristics of the yen. And I think that'll bring us into the setup for how folks have been exposed to the yen and how that exposure has interacted with the other assets in our ecosystem, tech stocks and so forth. But just give us a big picture. How do you frame out thought process on the yen? Yeah. So the risk property of a currency is a really interesting question. One's prior, thinking from a scientific perspective, is that no single currency should behave any differently in any environment than another. But the reason FX strategists exist, the reason FX trading exists, is because there's always an imbalance, this word again, imbalance. There's an imbalance in supply demand within any country's balance of payment. There may be more aggressive buyers than sellers for local equities, and that may push the currency higher. And then there may be more people going on holiday than coming back, which needs to sell the pound in the summer. So there may be more sellers than buyers and sterling falls. And well, FX strategy is effectively figuring out heuristics to try to figure out what those imbalances are and how they behave. We only ever get balance of payments data, best one month lagged at worst three months or longer lagged. So the risk characteristic of a currency really comes from analysis of the balance of payments and specifically which components of the balance of payments drive the currency performance. So yen is a great example here. For the longest time, it's been an investment currency, a currency in a country in which there's a huge local investment industry, lifers, pension funds, and so on, whose desire to see yield has pushed lots of investments overseas. So if we're thinking in terms of balance of payments, that means there's a lot of domestic capital outflow to foreign assets. Some of it may be FX hedged, some of it may be not FX hedged. But it means that during good times, during risk on periods, the most likely path of dollar yen is higher as Japanese investors buy foreign assets. During bad times, risk off periods, the most likely path of dollar yen is lower as the same investors begin to repatriate either to cover local losses or to stop loss on foreign investments or for any other reason to fund local liabilities. And then on top of this, if you like, fundamental behavior is all the speculative behavior of the speculative community in which everybody else thinks through this process and thinks, well, the yen behaves like this funding asset during risk on periods and like a safe haven asset during risk off periods. So if one were to think the current period is risk on, one should sell the yen and buy foreign assets and buy other currencies. And then if one were to think this period is risk off, one does the opposite thing. So this balance of payments behavior becomes magnified by the speculative community effectively doing the same kind of trade as locals. So then dollar yen becomes this very high beta risk currency pair. And over the last 12 months, probably two, three years. This has been exaggerated in the yen has been a funder while Bank of Japan policy has remained at zero, while interest rates elsewhere have risen. So the expected return of using the yen as a funder while investing elsewhere, whether that be in the dollar or anywhere else, has simply increased. So it's attracted an increasing amount of capital into this yen-funded carry trade. Yeah, and that's a really interesting backdrop and perhaps leads to the next area that we can explore. I was just created a chart of NVIDIA since 2022. Obviously, it's up a gigantic amount. And then I just did a NVIDIA in yen next to it. 
and it was up in even more gigantic amount. <laughs> and so this idea that the yen was a one-way train lower for such a long period of time, and it's just hard to get away from the extent to which central banks are wrapped around this the idea that yen is in this permanent state of deflation and they'll never get out of it. And they're the very last to even contemplate exiting zero interest rate policy. And so with that as a statement, and you start to peel away the onion in terms of what happened last week, the severity of it, I guess, is really what's on my mind. Because you'll always have an instance where there's a risk off and the yen is a currency that funds the risk rallies on the risk off. But something different happened here. And I'd just be curious, maybe just from your standpoint, set it all up for us from a FX strategy standpoint with respect to positioning going into it. Give us the big picture of what's on your mind as we survey the damage from last week. Yeah, that's a really good point. The central banks contribute to these imbalances. Central banks don't necessarily control the markets, but they certainly can push them in their directions. And then we can have these shocks. As we said earlier, these shocks may happen and there may not be large reactions to it. But if you have the imbalance leading into the shock, then you can certainly have an exaggerated reaction. And so for the yen trade, it's been a supercharged carry position, not just this year, but for the last two to three years, effectively since that original break of 115 or 120, wherever it was, right at the start of the Fed's tightening cycle. But it's not just been in spot, and that's probably the important thing here. It's been a long carry position expressed through long dollar yen spot, long cross yen spot, long mix yen, long video yen, short gamma positionings in FX options, short vol in FX options. There was an imbalance in spot, there was an imbalance in option space. And also, rightly or wrongly, these trades worked. As you say, NVIDIA and yen was bottom left to top right. A lot of PV was then invested in these positions, middle towards the middle and the end of July. So in the normal course of markets, you may get a drawdown. But if that drawdown takes place at a time when investors have a lot of money that could be lost, and there's a concentration and positioning in spot space and option space and derivative space, then you've got all of the ingredients for this unwind to be more powerful than usual, more supercharged than usual. One of the things I think is interesting, and I'm sure this is a big part of your work, is understanding spot vol dynamics in FX. And I'm just going back to Abenomics, that interesting, interesting period of just a wholesale shift in the philosophy that Japan was going to embrace to try to get themselves out of deflation. And so that really created some unique dynamics on the vol front. It really created a very strong inverse correlation between the yen and the Nikkei, as an example. But as I look back at the last couple of years, just thinking now just about the yen and the way in which the level of the yen interacts with, let's just say, pick a number, one month implied vol on the yen. You've had periods where a rapidly declining yen was associated with a decent bid to vol, pretty strong increase in implied vol. Some worry that they were going to lose it, that this thing was just going to be off to the races. You couldn't get it back type of thing. And then, of course, the opposite is also just recently been proven true. You can get a ferocious rally in the end, and that can be vol-inducing as well. So you sort of get both sides of it in some ways. Very different than an equity index. The S&P goes up, typically the vol goes down, vice versa. Love to have you talk to us out loud about just yen spot vol dynamics, what you expect from here, how they've shifted recently. How should investors understand that? Yeah, that's a really good point. The yen spot for correlation is typically expected to be negative, like it is expected to be in equities. And so in full parlance, in FX parlance, we call it the risk reversal. And the risk reversal is typically bid for puts. So calls, dollar yen calls typically trade below dollar yen puts. And usually high delta dollar yen calls also trade below the out the money for. But the characteristic of the last two years has really challenged that, as you say. I think we have to look at these in separate instances because there's been the two years rally from 120 to 160, and then there's been this behavior now. So let's take the last two years first, and then we'll take this behavior. 
Some of the analysis that we do at BNP Paribas, some of the analysis that we look at every week in the FX Vol strategy team, is we collate options traded that are reported to the DTCC, the central repository, and we analyze that data to figure out what options positioning looks like across all currency pairs, but in particular in these high liquidity, highly traded pairs like dollar yen. And if we rewind all the way back to the start of the tightening cycle, what we would see is what we usually see, a concentration of options positioning around the prevailing spot rate. So this is where physics actually does come in a bit and the law of large numbers also applies. All else equal, the options market settles down in a Gaussian distribution around prevailing spot. That's a steady state for the options market for there to be a reasonable amount of gamma hedging and position balance between upside and downside. But then there are these occasions when we see the options market unsettled and imbalanced around where prevailing spot is. And it often happens when the spot rate reaches the edge of a prevailing range. So at every big figure or every five big figures, 120, 125, 130, 140, 150, 155, 160, what we've seen in this dolly N options analysis, we call it strike map. What we've seen in the strike map is an absence of positioning, an absence of options owned above the highs. And so partly that speaks to A, an unwillingness to anticipate yet another wave of yen depreciation when it's already depreciated so far. Market participants have a lot of memory, a lot of history to trade against as well. And the idea that the yen keeps on breaking new lows over and over and over again is cognitively quite hard to get over. But because there's been this absence of positioning, every time spot has risen towards a high, we've had this positive spot vol correlation. As soon as the high gets broken, the market is compelled to buy calls, to rebalance its positions for the prevailing spot rate. And then the market breaks a new high and it rebalances positions for the prevailing spot rate. So due to the market's positioning going into the dollar yen rally, we've had this continuous episodic positive spot vol correlation where you see what you described, where one month vol gets bid every time there's a break, but then one month vol doesn't go bid in those periods where dollar yen consolidates before the next break. So that's really been the characteristic all the way up to 160 that the most profitable strategy every time we've got to the high in dollar yen was to buy a call past the highs because the most likely outcome would be a break and high volatility. That changed significantly, well, really after US CPI, this combination of CPI, the Fed, the BOJ, and then the soft and expected payrolls, aided by the rapid move lower in spot at the time. So if we think about the dollar yen positioning when we were between 155 and 160, that was largely long options, long call spreads, long carry type strategies, which earned money in a benign, low volatility environment. It specifically wasn't a setup in which the market owned convexity. And by convexity, I would mean 165 calls or even 145 puts. There was little ownership of low delta options, hedging or positioning for a big move one way or another in dollar yen. So when a big move did come, the market was caught wrong-sided. And then we get this typically empirical negative spot for correlation. Dolly yen goes down and dolly yen vol goes up. There was the period from, say, 160 to 155 where it wasn't clear exactly which way we would go. But one of the important dynamics at this time when we moved lower was the absence of corporate supply, which through most of the previous rally, has been there to sell some volatility on every dip, almost for the same reasons that speculators needed to buy some volatility on every rally. Corporate importers who needed to continually buy dollars at better levels, every time there was a little dip, it was opportunistic to effectively sell some puts to improve hedge rates over the long run. But then the change in dynamic over the last month coupled with the fact that that flow didn't emerge, led us to get through this gap in positioning and then see this positive spot vol correlation emerge. So dolly and lower, vol higher correlation emerge.
And it happened at the same time as Dolly and Spot fell into a gap in positioning, into a place where there was very little options ownership. And what that would correspond to is, well, if not many options are owned, there's not many natural gamma hedges. If there aren't many natural gamma hedges, realized volume is going to be higher than it was before. If realized volume is higher, implied have to be higher as well. So there was this reflexive reaction. We went to a level of spot that was underowned, that there was an imbalance. And then we had this higher vol, lower spot, higher uncertainty in Dolly Yen, all driven largely or precipitated largely by extended long carry positioning. It's always interesting to try to understand the supply demand dynamics in vol for an asset class. In the equity derivatives market, there's all kinds of people acting at different points in the strike curve and certainly the maturity curve down to one day. There's mutual funds and punters and hedge funds and there's overriders and so forth. And so they all come together and at some point there's a trade to be had. I think it's very interesting to hear your commentary that at least some part of perhaps the unexpectedly strong increase in vol as yen rallied is some function of the non-emergence of expected supply. I think you pointed to corporates. Tell us a little bit more about that, just the ecosystem of supply and demand. I assume there's a lot of hedge funds demanding optionality in various forms. Maybe it's through sometimes through spreads as well. But the big picture of how these prices come to be in vol land in terms of buyers on one side and sellers on another. Tell us a little bit more about that. As an asset class, FX is huge. What's the number? $7 trillion is transacted a day. As an asset class, FX speculation is tiny. It's minuscule in comparison. And the imbalance in, in FX fold, the supply and demand picture there, well, largely is driven by transactional FX players. It's driven by importers and exporters. It's somewhat driven by financial institutions as well. Structure supply, probably similar reasons that you see in equity space. FX vol is typically a mean reverting asset class. So the imbalances and the seasonality and the supply demand pressure we see is reasonably small. You know, we certainly don't have things like a Santa rally. You know, we don't have a positive trend in FX vol. The trend is zero. And kind of distributed around zero. But we still see significant seasonality. At the start of the calendar year in January, at the start of the fiscal year in Japan in April, we capture regular supply of vol. So this is from corporates and from structured supply, which are on the structured side, at least this is a yield enhancement product of any form. If it has currency exposure, then there's some element of selling an option around it, some element of harvesting premium in it. That may diminish in the future when yields are high, particularly if yields keep on rising in Japan. But for now, it's been consistent for the last 10 years, and it contributes to this vol supply picture. And then if you're an exporter from Europe and you're expecting income in dollars, then you may have different rules about how you hedge your dollar income. Some of those rules may be simply by the forward in the amount of income we expect. Some of the rules may be more sophisticated in terms of slightly more structured products to have forward participation. And some of those rules may turn into vol selling strategies. In aggregate, what we find is there's natural supply of vol from the transactional sector, and that outweighs natural demand from the speculative sector in the first half of the year. But it doesn't tend to outweigh demand in the second half of the year. So the way I think about that is, well, it's time-based, not price-based. And the start of the calendar year and the start of the fiscal year are times in which price-insensitive investors or price-insensitive participants would typically increase their hedge ratios. And then throughout the rest of the year, well, if we think about hedge funds, they have no acts to be massive buyers on the 1st of January or the 1st of July. There'll be vol buyers persistently throughout the year, especially when there's an opportunity. That is super interesting. I had not really understood there to be some version of seasonality with respect to supply and demand for optionality. That's really interesting. I wanted to get your take. We've alluded to it, but it's hard to get away from the fallout in some of the cross-asset corollaries. I mean, if we assume that a big part of this was 
the yen rallying, these consecutive 10% moves in the Nikkei have just really got me thinking and scratching my head about what does it tell us? You certainly alluded plenty to the degree of speculation that's yen financed over time, but two 10% moves in a row, it's got to tell us something. And the VIX got incredibly, and I would say disappointingly, dislocated the morning of August 5th throughout the day. Bid offers basically made the product untradeable. And the reason the VIX is untradeable is because the S&P options market broke relative to what you'd expect. And I get it. It's a 4% move in the S&P. That's a big move, this global tumult. But it just was a lot worse than it really ought to have been, even adjusted for some big moves around the world. What does it tell us? And then just on a going forward basis, we talked a little bit about your interaction with your economics teams that studying central banks. Of course, you're studying at BOJ and Ministry of Finance yourself. But what does it tell us about the potential going forward with respect to disruption? Yes, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. When we have these kind of sell-offs or crises beyond the event itself and the fallout of the event, it's really interesting to study what happened. It's like a fingerprint of the market. It's really interesting to study what happened, to understand where the fragility was, what the positioning was like, what the market behavior was like. And there's a lot of takeaways. It's where the science comes in. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Never let a failed experiment go to waste. And what happened then? Because it looked a lot like there was herding behavior in these successful trades. So for the first six months of this year and for previous years, the right trade in dollar yen has been to be long, been to be long spot and short fall in some limited loss form. The right trade in dollar China this year has been to be long spot and short vol. The right trade in Swiss has been to use it as a funder, and we could go on the right trade in Mex and the right trade in Brazil and so on. And some of these trades have unwound now, but if we're thinking about where the right trade was earlier in the year, then it was very much a long carry trade. So it looks like there was a lot of herding in these right trades. Why was there herding? We didn't used to get that back when I started. We were allergic to copying trades or allergic to jumping on the momentum bandwagon. And the whole point was to generate uncorrelated returns and generate alpha. You're not going to generate alpha if you're doing the thing that everybody else is doing. Or well, maybe if we think in terms of a bigger picture, the rise of multi-manager shops, which have tight stop loss limits and P&L pressure, we don't really have the opportunity or the time or the flexibility to think what happens in six months or one year or two years. You don't have the staying power for that anymore. Instead, you need to make P&L either quickly or consistently, which is a shorthand for saying you need to be long carry short options. <laughs> you don't want to be spending premium for three months in the case of an event which happens in three months on one day because you need to demonstrate P&L gains initially. And I think we saw some similar behavior following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 22. That was another example of fragility there. Because at the time, FX4 was even lower than it was in July. And there was the usual supply and demand, and there was the usual hedge fund flow and corporate flow, but also speculative short gamma strategies were really popular at the time, simply because they'd been working. And if they'd been working for three months, then you may as well add to your short gamma, increase the position. It's like momentum positioning involves and so you'd increase your positioning every time they work. But then an exogenous risk hits, and all of these strategies get stopped out. And probably most importantly, they don't come straight back. They stay out for a long time. So it's almost like we had the same dynamic going on into August, where the only trades being added to were the successful trades. The only successful trades were the carry trades. The best carry trades were in yen and CNH. So there was a concentration and a herding. So by the time we actually had the unwind pressure, a lot of the spec market was all the same way. And so we get this breakdown in market behavior. Options markets are insurance markets. And I sometimes think about the actual insurance markets like property insurance. And they have this concept of a hard market. There's an event, an insurance event that causes capital to be lost because there's a payout on some catastrophe. 
And then the market takes a while to reprice itself because the capital is just really not there. It just takes a bit of time. So it's like you get the event and the VIX of the property market goes to 40 and it gets stuck there for a while as the capital rebuilds itself. I've seen that in the actual equity derivatives market as well. Certainly post the COVID crash of March of 2020, there was such a loss of capital in equity vol carry strategies that it took fully two years for the vol risk premium to settle back to something that's more normal. What's the fallout just in terms of the carry trades that were working spectacularly and then have all gotten hit in FX? What are the implications going forward in terms of things like vol risk premium or the capacity to bear risk in these strategies? How do you see pricing materializing going forward? The way I think about this is that FX vol all surfaces that anchor somewhat, that anchor by realized and Volvo's premium, it can only get so high until, as you said earlier, somebody decides that they have enough compensation to sell the option. But they also reflect supply and demand. And Dolly is a good example here. Implied Vol is likely to stay elevated until supply and demand gets to an equilibrium. And what that means is, in terms of our analytics, we see our strike map saying that there's a reasonably balanced options profile around the prevailing spot rate. At the moment, the options profile is still quite mismatched. They're still not much owned to the downside and still more owned to the top side. So in terms of the pressure points, there may still be some pressure. There may still be high realized volume. There may still be supported dolly head volume. And you mentioned earlier, VIX snapped back very quickly, which could either be a reflection of a very quick unwind and cleaning out of positions, or it could be a reflection of the unwind was far from completed and instead positions started being added. And actually, we're seeing something similar in dollar China at the moment, where the positioning and the initial setup was similar to dollar yen. And actually, the move in dollar China vol is huge. Realized vol in dollar China was two point something a few weeks ago and is above five now. Okay, you're a fixed specialist, and the idea of realized vol being two is completely alien. But it more than doubled in a couple of weeks on a few 1% moves. A very big move there. But actually, if we take a look at what the vol smile has done between last week and today, it looks like the supply and demand in dollar China is for top side options again. It looks like the demand is to re add to a long dollar CNH trade. Now, either that means the market is fully covered and the unwind is over, or it means there could be more pain to come. It's hard to say what the answer is in that case, but it's notable that there appears to have been a rapid recovery in investor behavior in that pair compared to, say, in dollar yen, where there's still a lot of time to go or a lot of wood to chop before it looks like the market is balanced. Well, last question I want you to reflect on a little bit, and I think we've gotten to it to some degree, but I think what's so interesting is for the last couple of years, the market narrative has been that aggressive Fed tightening can create spillover into other asset classes, other countries. It can be destabilizing, Fed tightening. And to some degree, there were elements where it was. And now it's almost as if the opposite may be true, where if, I don't know, US disinflation continues or the growth slowdown continues to present itself, and then God forbid, Japan does more than we've expected from a monetary tightening standpoint. Boy, is that the canary in the coal mine with respect to risk? And I guess my question is, we got a window here into some fragility here. Is there potential with respect to this re-emerging as a protracted risk event? Should we see, again, the Fed ease more than we expect and other central banks, maybe namely Japan, do more on the opposite front? I think we mentioned this at the very beginning. It's important to remain evidence-based. And if somebody comes in and says, well, the Fed is tightening too quickly and it will break markets, the Fed is easing too quickly and it will break markets, my antenna immediately picks up and thinks, well, the Fed isn't breaking markets. So what do we actually mean here? But you're absolutely right. The dolly yen move is a window into dolly yen fragility. I think what's really interesting in dolly yen is the cross-asset correlation that took place 
we look at correlations in slightly different ways in vol because it's an asset class with a lot of noise. There's a lot of stochastic volatility in vol. So we want to make sure that we capture the moves rather than just the noise. And to do that, we just look at correlations in the up direction. So if S&P vol goes up, what does dolly n vol do? If S rates vol goes up, what does dolly n vol do? And so on. And what we found was the fingerprint of the sell-off was Nikkei and S&P vol, not US rates vol. So from that respect, it looks like it was largely a position on mind driven move. So could it re-emerge if the Fed keeps easing? Well, if the Fed keeps easing, what happens to US rates fall? What happens to S&P? What happens to S&P vol? And therefore, what happens to dolly yen? Unfortunately, there are two different ways the Fed can ease. One is the recessionary easing, 2007 style. One is the soft landing kind of easing or the mid-cycle slowdown kind of easing like 1995. The former is clearly dollar positive, vol positive, actually spot vol correlation strengthens when in those outcomes the dollar goes up and risk sells off. In that case, it would be dolly and negative and vol positive. The latter is actually dollar bearish, risk positive and vol bearish. So we can't escape from reflexivity. Now the reflexivity is between what the economic data is telling us about the nature of the slowdown, whether it's soft or hard or recessionary, and therefore what kind of cutting cycle we'll see. In retrospect, when the market was pricing an intermeeting cuts this time last week, that looked like it was a response to a rapid tightening in financial conditions, which were anticipated to continue and potentially destabilize markets. In the end, they didn't. And some of what we've been talking about has been how the market has stabilized since then. So well framed. I mean, I like to think about it as, is the Fed easing or tightening because they can or because they have to? In your two scenarios, the latter was more that we can. We've got this immaculate disinflation job complete. And so we'll bring things down to a level that's more akin to equilibrium versus we're chasing it and we got to do this fast. That's got different implications for a lot of different assets, the shape of the yield curve, certainly vol and so forth. So very, very interesting. So much to think about. Oliver, this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And Again, it's proven extremely timely in a way that I don't think we expected, but certainly listeners to the Alpha Exchange are going to appreciate the insights from an expert on FX Vol. So thanks again for taking the time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus. Please email us at feedback at alphaexchangepodcast.com. Thanks again and catch you next time. Mm -hmm.